<coughs> so I want to talk today about what I call the warped side of the universe, by which I mean phenomena and objects that are made largely or entirely from warped space and time. Of course, the uh, ex example of this that is best known is the black hole. Uh, and I think we all know that the black hole is described by a space-time metric with a spatial metric uh, that uh, can be displayed uh, pictorially in terms of an embedding diagram uh, that shows the uh, sh uh, intrinsic geometry of an equatorial slice through the black hole uh, by embedding it in a flat uh, uh, higher dimensional space. Uh, there is also in the space-time metric a scalar term uh, which is an angular velocity of dragging of inertial frames. I like to think of this in terms of space like, rather like a fluid like the air in our tornado being dragged into a whirling motion around the horizon, larger angular velocity omega near the horizon, lower angular velocity farther away. And finally, there is what is called the lapse function alpha uh, which uh, measures the slowing of time as you near the horizon of the black hole. And I'm going to talk uh, later in the lecture about the challenge to measure the space-time geometry of, black, of quiescent black holes and uh, see all of these metric functions and see whether they agree with what is predicted uh, by general relativity. This is a, a depiction of the actual space-time geometry around a, a curved black hole that's rapidly rotating, 0.998, which is this sort of magic value that uh, a thin accretion disk will buffer a black hole into. Uh, and uh, so you see color-coded here the lapse function. Oh, the rate of flow of time is 20% of what it is far away at the transition between the purple and the, the blue in here. And you see the angular velocity of frame dragging uh, proportional to the length of the white arrows. What I would, uh, you can think of this as being rather like a map of uh, the surface of the Earth or the surface of Mars. And the challenge of what we call bothrodicy in our field is to uh, make observational maps of the space-time geometry and see whether it agrees with this map. The warp side of the universe has other kinds of hypothetical objects. There's the Big Bang singularity. There is uh, our universe, uh, which is suggested by string theorists that it uh, is a brain that lives in a higher dimensional bulk. Uh, there are cosmic strings for which the circumference differs, uh, divided by the radius, differs by, from 2 pi by a small amount that depends on the uh, mass per unit length or the, the tension of the string. Uh, there are singularities inside black holes. There uh, are hypothetical naked singularities. This is just uh, my fanciful diagram, rather like those of you who know Dr. Seuss uh, books for children. Uh, 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 and there are wormholes, again, hypothetical objects. And of course, there are gravitational waves, which uh, I think are not quite so hypothetical. So the question is, uh, of these objects on the warp side, side of the universe, hypothesized objects, which ones are real? Which ones really exist? And what else might there be of objects made largely from warp space and time? Uh, we have a, two, a set of tools for probing these questions. When you ask what kinds of objects might exist on the warped side, uh, of course, general relativity theory is the thing that uh, tells you in the classical domain what the answer should be. And uh, in the era when Jean-Pierre and I were uh, at Les Uches and there, then here at the IAP, uh, we were, uh, it was a very exciting era when uh, rapid progress was made uh, on understanding black holes and gravitational waves particularly. Uh, but that progress slowed and uh, became much, much, uh, uh, this became a much less exciting area by the early 1980s because the approximation techniques that had been developed and then also some more sophisticated mathematical techniques like topological methods had pretty much played out. We'd done almost as much with them as uh, one could do. However, this subject is currently being uh, rapidly uh, reinvigorated by numerical simulations, uh, numerical solutions of Einstein's equations, and that is what is going to tell us in the future uh, what 
uh, should exist, what might exist on the warp side of the universe and how it behaves. And that will be part one of my seminar. When you ask what objects actually do exist on the warp side and what are their properties, well, electromagnetic observations have brought us some information, but rather limited. A lot of information about, for example, about the roles of black holes in astrophysics, but not much information about the properties of black holes, about the detailed, uh, details of the warp space and time around them. Gravitational waves, of course, are a new tool for doing this, and they're the ideal tool for probing the warped side because they themselves are made from warped space and time. So part two of my seminar will deal with gravitational wave observations aimed at uh, uh, telling us what actually happens on the warped side of the universe. So let me begin with uh, numerical relativity. The holy grail, uh, the big goal of numerical relativity uh, in recent years has been to study the collisions of black holes, uh, and these collisions, in fact, are the most violent events in the universe. You have this, in this artist's conception, which uh, was drawn up for us when we were beginning the LIGO project back uh, in the 1980s, you have two black holes spiraling around together, merging uh, into one black hole, and we know now, and we had order of magnitude estimates uh, then, that about 10% of the mass of these black holes is converted to gravitational radiation, which of course is 20 times larger than the most you can get out of nuclear burning in stars. And so uh, they, these are uh, black hole mergers are really in uh, the most violent events that occur in the universe today, the most violent events aside from the Big Bang itself. And to re-emphasize that, you can ask what is the luminosity that comes off in gravitational waves in a black hole collision? Well, you get off 10% of the rest mass energy of the black holes, and it comes off in a time of order 100 or of order 50 uh, times the light travel time across the Schwarzschild radius, uh, or 100 gm over c cubed. The factors of m, where m is the mass of the black holes, cancels out, and you have about 10 to the minus 3 c squared over g. Uh, which is uh, 10 to the 24 solar luminosities. I think that should be c to the fifth over g, I forget. 10 to the 24 solar luminosities are 10 to the four times the total luminosity of all the stars in the, gal in the universe put together. 10 to, 10 to the 24, or 10 to the four universe luminosities. It's a lot, a lot of power. And uh, of course it comes off very quickly if these are small black holes in a fraction of a second if they're solar mass black holes, uh, but uh, in a time that is more like hours for supermassive black holes. And of course there are no electromagnetic waves emitted whatsoever by the black holes themselves, but there are, should be from disturbed accretion disks. Uh, and so one of the big goals of the field of gravitational wave observations, a goal that is becoming more and more uh, vigorous at, uh, at Caltech among our ast astronomers uh, in an effort led by Sri Kulkarni, is to see the electromagnetic emissions that accompany uh, th uh, black hole mergers uh, using electromagnetic telescopes. Uh, the collisions of black holes are very interesting because the details of the collision are encoded in the gravitational waves waveforms. And so what we want to do in uh, observations is to monitor the waveforms and from the waveforms deduce what was happening in the black hole collision. Uh, the black holes as they collide create wild vibrations of warped space time. And I like to think about it in the following uh, kind of a picture that each black hole spins, it drags space into motion around it itself, and so you have two black holes spinning, creating tornado-like motions of space. As they orbit each other, their angular, orbital angular momentum drags space into motion, and so you have two black holes, er, two tornadoes embedded in a third larger tornado, and they come crashing together, and we would like to know what happens when they're made from warped space and time rather than from uh, air. And uh, the answer to that uh, we are beginning to learn through numerical relativity simulations. So, so let me talk about numerical relativity, how this is uh, done. In numerical relativity, the challenge is to evolve the geometry of space-time rather than evolving fields in space-time as you do in other areas of computational science. You choose an initial space-like three-dimensional surface in space-time, and you lay down a coordinate system on that surface. 
Uh, you specify on that surface the three-dimensional metric that uh, describes the geometry of space on the surface. And the so-called so extrinsic curvature, which can be thought of as the first time derivative of the metric, it is actually the manner in which that surface is curved up in the surrounding space-time. These are two symmetric uh, 30 by 3 tensors, third rank tensor fields that are to be specified, but they cannot be specified freely. They have to be sub specified subject to certain constrained equations, uh, which are the analogs of the uh, divergence of the magnetic field equal to zero in uh, electromagnetic theory. Uh, and these constrained equations are four of the uh, tan Einstein equations, and the other six are evolution equations that evolve the metric forward in time after you have specified the, uh, satisfied the constrained equations at the initial moment of time. You then lay out coordinates to the future of this hypersurface by specifying the lapse function, uh, which uh, tells you how fast you want to push uh, your, your next surface uh, forward in time, and the shift function, which tells you how the coordinates move spatially from one, as you move from one surface to another. You then integrate the three-dimensional metric forward in time from one surface to another using the six dynamical, Einstein dynamical equations, and then you build the entire space-time metric uh, out of the three-dimensional metric and the lapse and shift function. So that's the way this is done. Uh, and there are now two mature approaches to uh, doing this kind of numerical relativity. The first is using finite difference methods, which are the standard method used in computational science uh, uh, when you're dealing with, uh, with the evolution of continuum systems. Uh, the finite difference methods are very robust uh, now, and they have power law convergence, and they've been used in the last few years to get out a lot of interesting astrophysics, such as the kick velocities of uh, the final black hole when two black holes merge. The second te technique, which is described in a very nice Living Reviews article by Grand Clément and Novak, uh, is the so-called spectral method, in which you divide up the space around the two black holes. One black hole is down in here where you can't see it, and the other is down in there where you can't see it. You divide up the space around the two black holes uh, into cells, and e in each cell you expand in uh, basis functions. It could be Fourier series, it could be Chebyshev uh, polynomials. And you evolve uh, the coefficients of that expansion. Uh, and each cell uh, and uh, the coefficients that you're evolving is put on one uh, CPU of a, a computer cluster. And then the CPUs talk to each other, exchanging information about what's going on at the boundaries between these cells. This is very fast uh, and has very high accuracies because uh, when you use these techniques, uh, the convergence is exponential. And so it's really remarkable to see how you go from, say, 43 by 43 by 43 grid, 43 cubed grid, to say a 50 by 50 by 50 grid, and uh, your uh, accuracy improves by a factor of 10. Then you go to something like a 58 by 58 by 58 grid, and it improves another factor of 10. It's just enormously fast convergence, uh, and which leads to very high accuracy and high speed. But this technique is much more complicated to make work. And so the history in fluid mechanics is everybody did finite difference initially, but, uh, and it took longer for the spectral methods to be uh, brought to fruition in fluid mechanics, but now if you don't have shocks, uh, then this has a, a exponential co a convergence also in fluid mechanics, and it's the method of preference, or a method of preference. Uh, the gravitational wave field is known not to shock, and so it's known that you will always have exponential convergence if you're working with vacuum gravity, the vacuum curved space-time. There are two major pitfalls in, that have, people have struggled with in the last decade uh, in doing numeric relativity. The first was what is called constraint violation instabilities. If you make a slight initial error in satisfying the constraints, that is the analog of uh, divergence of B is equal to zero, that error will grow with time. This is not due to numerical effects, it'll grow analytically with time and often exponentially. 
And it was not understood 10 years ago that the problem was that this was built right into the equations and, was blow, and think the blow up was, was an analytical blow up. It took some superb applied mathematicians to uh, help sort that out. But it had been solved by 2005 after about five years of struggle and there are now several different techniques for dealing with these constraint instabilities for stabilizing the evolution. Uh, the uh, second major problem that we've had in the last decade is uh, uh, keeping the coordinate system from going singular. Uh, and this was robustly solved, uh, and, and that's, that's a problem of how do you lay out the lapse and shift functions in order to maintain very well behaved coordinates, and that's a lot harder than it sounds. It was robustly solved in the finite difference codes around 2006, but it's only in the last month or two that this has been robustly solved in the spectral codes. And there's a paper that went on the archive about a month ago that uh, spells out uh, how uh, this, this can now be done in the spectral codes as well and, and demonstrates it with a number of generic simulations. Uh, the first big breakthrough in numerical relativity was the first successful simulation of uh, two black holes orbiting each other and merging non-spinning black holes by Franz Pretorius, who at the time was a postdoc in my group at Caltech. He's now an assist assistant professor at Princeton. This is from one of his first simulations. It shows the lapse function, the uh, slowing of the rate of flow of time near the black hole, uh, co color coded. And uh, you see the two black holes. And I'm just going to play his movie. Uh, it was just wonderful at the time to see these two black holes go around each other, merge, vibrate a bit and settle down and the computer didn't crash. Because prior to that, you couldn't do even a quarter of an orbit without the computer crashing because of uh, these problems with constraint violation instabilities. Um, this was followed six months later, uh, around uh, Christmas of uh, 2005, by simultaneous success using a, diff a little different set of finite difference techniques by the group at the University of Texas at Brownsville, led by Campanelli, Lowstow, and Slockauer, and the group at the Goddard Space Flight Center, Baker, Centrella, Choi, and colleagues, and then by many others using finite difference techniques. So that here is a list just from off the top of my head of some, it's probably most, but certainly not all numerical relativity groups today, uh, and most of whom are doing simulations of binary black holes, some are doing other things. Uh, and if you look at this, this set of groups today, well, one thing that is striking is the rate of growth of the field. There have just been a, a number of these uh, uh, groups didn't exist several years ago. There are two new groups in the last uh, something like 18 months, or four new groups in the last 18 months or so, two of which in some sense uh, are off growths, outgrowths of our Caltech Cornell effort. So these are the groups doing finite difference methods. And these are the groups doing spectral methods. Uh, and the uh, only spectral code that is now mature and robustly uh, merging black holes is the code written by a Caltech Cornell uh, collaboration that is uh, basically people trained originally largely by Saul Tucholsky. Uh, and the two spin-off groups, which are also now using our spectral code, is uh, one at CETA. Uh, in Canada, uh, led by uh, Pfeiffer, and one at the University of Maryland, uh, led by Manuel Tiglio. Uh, the finite difference group spent the period 2006 to 2009 uh, doing astrophysical studies at moderate accuracy of things like uh, the final kick velocity of the merged black holes. Uh, on our, in our Caltech Cornell group, we spent those uh, three, uh, three, three and a half years primarily struggling to solve this problem of coordinate system going bad and, bad and various other uh, difficulties that are peculiar to the spectral methods, but also embarking on gravitational wave studies at high accuracy and fast speed and uh, beginning to explore the nonlinear dynamics of curved space time. And so I want to give you some sense of where things now stand. So this is the state of the art today uh, in this field. The only movie that I have, the only really nice movie showing the full space-time geometry in a merger is for non-spinning black holes. And so that's what I'm going to show to you. 
Uh, there are 16 orbits of, uh, of in spiral followed by the collision, merger, and ring down. Uh, and the gravitational waveforms that come off have a cumulative phase error of uh, one one hundredth of a radium, which is more higher accuracy than LIGO and Virgo uh, are probably ever going to need. It's uh, basically the maximum accuracy that they're going to need. You're going to see an embedding diagram where you see the warping of space around the two black holes. Uh, you see the color-coded uh, uh, lapse function. You see the negative of the shift, which you can think of as the angular velocity of, uh, of uh, 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 the linear velocity of the dragging of inertial frames. Uh, and you're going to see three segments of this movie. Up at the top, you see two black holes as you might see them if you were watching them with a blue sky behind them in the real universe. You see down here the embedding diagram uh, that depicts the entire, in the equatorial plane, the entire space-time geometry. And down here you see the waveform. When we get uh, something like three or four orbits uh, done, this gets very boring. And so we will jump until just before the merger. Uh, and then we will pause the movie uh, as the merger occurs so you can admire uh, the merger. And then uh, we'll watch the black holes begin to ring down, the final black hole begin to ring down. So. So this movie was made by Harold Pfeiffer in uh, our group uh, using the spec code that was developed by himself and uh, other colleagues originally trained by Saul Tikolsky. So we're in here, we just have jumped uh, to nearly the end. The merger is about to occur. We were pausing there, the merger is occurring and uh, the final black hole is uh, oscillating, ringing down. Um, the reason that we, the motivation, the primary motivation for our creating a group at Caltech is uh, that uh, I was very worried that we would not have the capability to extract the science from uh, observed gravitational waves uh, because uh, the numerical relativity was not mature enough and uh, the gravitational wave detectors were becoming quite mature. And so our principal goal has been to be able to simulate black hole collisions and then black hole neutron star mergers uh, with uh, very high accuracy, the accuracy that's needed in gravitational wave observations and uh, with uh, a very high speed so we could uh, build a complete set of waveforms for use in data analysis. And uh, basically the goal then is to be able to have a Rosetta Stone or a dictionary uh, by which you can look at gravitational waveforms and you can go back and forth between them and what's going on in the black hole mergers. And so it's basically a dictionary of the connection between the physics of what's happening in the merger and uh, what the waveforms look like. The waveforms that we're building now, uh, have begun to build at very high accuracy, are built by uh, taking the post-Newtonian waveforms developed by the techniques that are pioneered uh, by Luc Blanchet and colleagues uh, and by Clifford Will and colleagues. Take the post-Newtonian uh, waveforms up until the last uh, 10 orbits or so, the last uh, 20 cycles of gravitational waves or so of inspiral join them smoothly onto the numerical relativity simulations because you have to do this because the post-Newtonian theory is failing and can no longer give you the accuracy that's required uh, roughly uh, 20 cycles before the end. Join them onto uh, numerical simulations uh, to get a complete family, uh, to get a complete and highly accurate waveform. Uh, there are seven parameters uh, for binary black hole systems, the uh, seven non-trivial parameters. Uh, the mass ratio, uh, the vectorial spins at some initial moment of time. Uh, we need to do, in order to cover this seven parameter uh, space with sufficient, uh, sufficiently, uh, de sufficient density of waveforms to get the required accuracies, we estimate that we're going to need about 500 simulations. Uh, plus each one joined onto the post-Newtonian waveforms to underpin the gravitational wave data analysis. Uh, 
or Alessandro Buonanno, who uh, was here at the IAP until recently, uh, is organizing this effort and uh, will be using the Effective One Body Framework, which she and Thibaut de Moore developed, uh, as a framework for an analytic approximation to the waveforms that are developed. What's required is we need analytic waveforms because uh, in the data analysis one, has, analysis one has to generate large numbers of waveforms very quickly in order for the data analysis to be done efficiently. And so you have to do an analytic fit to these 500 simulations plus post-Newtonian. Uh, and for searches for gravitational waves, we need a phase accuracy of at least a, a tenth of a radian. And uh, for information extraction, for the first stage of information extraction in a hierarchical process, you need probably one, uh, one one hundredth of a radian phase accuracy. Uh, for generic simulations, the finite difference code uh, that uh, has been developed at Caltech and Cornell can, uh, or I'm sorry, the finite difference codes that are, uh, that are operating in a number of groups around the world can get phase accuracies of 0.1, which is needed for searches, but to build a waveform requires each waveform about 100 CPU years per simulation. The spectral code can uh, easily get the 100th of a radian accuracy and uh, it requires about 10 CPU years. So if we need 500 simulations, that means we need 5,000 CPU years, which means that a cluster of several thousand uh, uh, CPUs uh, running for a, a couple of years is basically what we need using spec, and that's what we're going after over the next, the next few years. For black hole neutron star binary, it's a little bit uh, more interesting and complicated because of the unknown equation of state at densities between the new density of an atomic nucleus and 10 times the density of an atomic nucleus. And here, then, the goal, and this is, uh, we're still a year or two away from be, being able to begin doing production simulations here, by contrast with the black hole case. Here, uh, the challenge is going to be to build a, a family of waveforms that also have a parameterization of the unknown equation of state, uh, as well as uh, the uh, uh, initial parameters, the non-trivial parameters of the, of the neutron star black hole system. Let me uh, return to the issue of nonlinear uh, space-time dynamics and talk about spinning black holes. There was a very interesting simulation done by the group of Campanelli, Lowstow, and Slochauer of what has come to be called the extreme kick configuration, where you have two black holes orbiting each other with their spins pointed in opposite directions and lying in the equatorial plane. And I'm going to show you the, uh, a movie that they made of, uh, these, uh, of uh, this evolution. There we go. It's quite remarkable. You notice they go up together, then they go down together, then they go up together, then they go down together in violation of momentum conservation. There are only two bodies in the system, and they're doing the same thing up and down and up and down as they go around. This is quite striking. And uh, so this got us interested at Caltech in the question, well, where is uh, the momentum to compensate for that? Uh, the physics of what's going on and making them go up and down, a piece of the physics anyway, is rather simple. It's the same physics as you see in fluid mechanics if you have two vortices. I'm going to show you a movie made uh, of just water which has uh, some uh, white powder on the surface so you can see the flow of the water. And the black thing that you see in here is an aerofoil. It's basically a piece of wood that has the shape of a wing. And the aerofoil is going to generate two vortices. For those who know about such things, a starting vortex and a, a, and a stopping vortex is it starts to move and then stops. And this always happens when, you, when an airplane starts to move. It uh, creates a vortex that strings back behind it, itself. And when it stops, it uh, creates an opposite vortex. So it's interesting to see how these vortices move. There they are, they're each dragging the other one downward. If you look at it, the, I guess I've got to let it go all the way to the end before I, okay, so this one 
drags water over there down and th that vortex is sitting in the water that's over there and so it gets moved downward. Similarly, this guy drags water over there down and that vortex over there is uh, riding in the water and it's dragged down. So they drag each other downward. This is also the way a smoke ring propels itself. And uh, that's what is going on here, or it's part of the physics that's going on here. You have two black holes. Uh, these are the directions of their spins. This black hole is dragging space into motion so that space uh, between it uh, and the other black hole, and also the other black hole is dragged into the screen. And this black hole spins and it drags space and the other black hole into the screen. Uh, and so you can write down, just in the post-Newtonian approximation, the momentum density. It turns out in the post-Newtonian approximation, the momentum density is minus 1 over 4 pi g cross h, where g is the Newtonian gravitational acceleration uh, produced by one of the black holes, and h is the uh, so-called gravitomagnetic field, the analog of a magnetic field created by the other black hole. You can just uh, do a little vector uh, analysis of g cross h with your, with your fingers, knowing that the h produced by these uh, black holes is just like a dipole magnetic field around the Earth. And you can see that there is momentum density coming out of the screen out here and going into the screen uh, in the red region. And as the black holes go around each other, uh, the momentum uh, flows uh, between the uh, external space and the black holes. And when they have gone halfway around, the black holes, instead of going into the screen, they're pulling each other out of the screen. This is not the entire story. Each black hole also generate, also couples to the gravitomagnetic field produced by the other black hole, spin uh, uh, gravitational field or gra spin gravitomagnetic coupling, which has also about the same uh, strength as uh, the, this uh, uh, frame dragging type of effect. And the two of those uh, then together uh, cause the behavior that you see. Uh, we have, uh, in order to understand what happens during a merger, we look at the simplest possible merger, a head on merger of two black holes with transverse spins. And what you see is the following this is from a paper that's uh, on the web. Uh, the, uh, this is the, uh, the Vertical velocity, they're dragging each other in the negative direction, that is into the screen in the preceding slide. Uh, initially, they collide, merge about here, and then the merged black hole goes flying up and then down and then settles down. This is the velocity as a function of time. Uh, what is happening is, as I told you, that space between the black holes is also being dragged down. This is, these are pictures of the event horizon, the absolute event horizon from the simulation. Space is being dragged down, uh, and so as the black holes merge, they swallow additional downward momentum from the space between the black holes. Uh, but then when they start to pulsate, they st uh, swallow upward momentum that was in that blue region on the preceding uh, slide. And the pulsations, they swallow alternatively upward and downward momentum and then settle down into equilibrium. And so it's been very interesting to sort out the momentum flow that is occurring here. But then if you know a little bit of relativity, you uh, might say, well, this is, a, this is a swindle. This is a cheat. How can this be? Because how do you even define momentum in curved space-time? In order to compute a momentum, you have to add up the momentum at different locations in space and bring, the, bring momentum vectors together, momentum density vectors together and add them. But in curved space, if you try to parallel transport a piece of momentum that is, say, uh, here, uh, to uh, add it onto a piece of momentum that's, say, there, if you parallel transport vectors around closed curves, as I think we, most of us know, uh, the vector changes. And so there's no way, it seems, to even define the uh, total linear momentum of the system, or talk about how, or, or define the linear momentum of the two holes separately and define uh, the momentum density between them. Momentum uh, conservation, in fact, arises from a translation invariance of space time, and the black hole, black hole space time has no such translation invariance. So, nevertheless, we see these black holes do their thing. Uh, and in the post-Newtonian approximation, you have no difficulty defining momentum density. 
And so what we have done in order to discuss this is rewrite general relativity as a nonlinear field theory in flat space time, and then momentum density follows from the translation invariance of the flat space time. We just use the techniques in, uh, in the ancient textbook by Landau and Lifshitz. But then uh, a rigorous uh, relativist will say, well, the mapping is not unique. This momentum is very gauge dependent. And our answer is, it's not all that gauge dependent. We do different simulations in different gauges using very different codes. We use a finite difference code. We use a spectral code. Uh, we uh, use completely different numerical relativity uh, techniques in completely different gauges. And to within factors of a few tens of percent, uh, we get the same results. So I would like to argue that uh, we need to rethink relativity in the following sense that uh, when dealing, when trying to understand black hole mergers, we want to introduce a concept of a good gauge. And a good gauge is basically one in which the metric coefficients of curved space-time are all of order unity and not, uh, not blowing up. So the coordinates uh, are quasi-Cartesian. And then the phenomena that are happening here are so robust that you'll get the same results in all good gauges. And we have uh, uh, we have experimental evidence for that, but th there is no uh, really good theory of that. Well, time is running away with me. I want, want to just mention that there's a lot of fundamental physics to be done with numerical relativity. Uh, an example uh, of things from the past is that David Garfinkel verified through numerical relativity simulations the uh, the genericity, the, the, the fact that the so-called Belinsky kalatnikov lifshitz singularity structure, which is a chaotic singularity structure of stretches and squeezes that you would feel if, uh, if you fell into a singularity, say the singularity of the center of a black hole, uh, it was a singularity structure that was discovered by these Russians in the uh, late 60s and early 70s. There was great skepticism in the West as to whether or not uh, what they were doing uh, really reflected how things behave in general relativity because of the approximations that they were using and a doubt as to whether the approximations were valid. Well, simu numerical simulations have verified that they were right and that the generic singularity structure is as they described. Uh, there is famous uh, work on cosmic censorship conjecture uh, in which uh, Roger Penrose conjectured, conjectured that all singularities except the Big Bang are hidden inside black holes. Numerical simulations in numerical relativity by Matt Chop Tuick uh, involving imploding initially scalar waves and then later by other people gravitational waves toward a common center with almost but not quite enough energy to form a black hole revealed the waves coming in interacting non-linearly through wave-wave mixing producing a very interesting uh, structure that uh, of warped space-time that uh, exhibits critical behavior in scaling like occur in phase transitions and condensed matter, and at the end uh, of the simulation, a naked singularity. And uh, Dimitris Christodoulou then, after the simulation showed this, was able to demonstrate analytically that there really was a naked singularity formed. But it's probably a highly unstable naked singularity that requires fine-tuning in order to form. Uh, in the future, we would like to uh, study the issue of uh, how much so-called violation of the null energy condition is required to hold a wormhole open. Numerical relativity uh, will tell us that, and quantum field theory tells you how much violation of this, uh, this so-called null energy condition uh, you actually can get in, uh, in nature. And I think it's only through a combination of numerical relativity uh, and quantum field theory in curved space time that we will really get a handle on whether or not wormholes can be held open and thereby be made traversable. But I want to move to the uh, last part of my talk and talk uh, fairly briefly about gravitational wave observations, uh, having exposed to you the, the excitement that's now going on in numeric relativity. So as you're all aware, what a gravitational wave does is it passes into the screen is it can be thought of as stretching and squeezing space. What it's really doing is it's taking inertial frames that are initially at rest with respect to each other and moving them relative to each other as the wave passes. Uh, and that uh, motion then uh, is detected, uh, or we attempt to detect it using laser interferometer gravitational wave detectors. 
uh, by hanging uh, four mirrors from overhead supports. Uh, and when uh, the wave comes by, it pushes these mirrors apart while it's pushing those together. And then in the next half cycle, pushes these apart while it pushes those together. And laser interferometry, of course, is used to monitor this. And I think this is uh, probably familiar to all of you. Uh, in terms of uh, numbers, the delta L that uh, we are measuring in uh, LIGO and in Virgo, uh, it's given by the gravitational wave field, which is really the second time integral of the Riemann curvature tensor, uh, times the separation between those mirrors. Uh, with an h of 10 to the minus 21 or smaller, which we expect from astrophysical estimates, and an arm length of 4 kilometers, the motions that we have to measure are 4 times 10 to the minus 16 centimeters. And so the noise in the first generation of detectors is at about the level of 1 times 10 to the minus 16 centimeters, or 10 to the minus 3 of a Fermi, uh, which is impressive, very impressive. And so uh, people who have not studied how this is done find it rather outrageous to claim that you can measure mirror displacements with mirrors separated by four kilometers to an accuracy of a thousandth of the diameter of the nucleus of an atom. Uh, and there is even an exercise in this thick book that uh, Jean-Pierre mentioned, an exercise that I wrote in about 1971 that basically says, show that it's ridiculous to think that you can do this. And of course, I have spent much of the last uh, 20 years of my life helping the experimenters do it. Um, the keys to success are averaging over space and time. If you think of these as being the atoms in the uh, surface of uh, a mirror, that uh, the laser beam is large. The laser beam uh, is uh, in the adv our advanced detectors will be about 20 centimeters in diameter. It's a big uh, laser beam. It averages over something like 10 to the 18 surface atoms. So it's averaging over lots of atoms. It averages over time the Debye frequency of oscillations of these atoms in their crystal lattice is 10 to the 13 hertz. And uh, we make our observations around 100 hertz. So we average over something like 10 to the 11 oscillations of, of the atoms in their crystal lattice. And so with this averaging, we basically are able, uh, the experimenters are able to get rid of uh, the noise that is due to uh, what's going on in the mirror. You have to isolate uh, the detectors from the environment with uh, seismic isolation stacks and with pendula by which the mirrors hang. Uh, and you have to use lots and lots of photons, uh, some 10 to the 20 photons uh, in a hundredth of a second averaging time. And uh, when you do that, you can pull this off. Uh, these experimenters have uh, shown that they can. And so as you're probably aware, there is uh, now an Earth-based network of gravitational wave detectors that's going after, among other things, gravitational waves from black holes of stellar mass. Uh, there are two LIGO detectors in the United States, the GEO 600 detector in Hanover, Germany, the French-Italian Virgo detector in Pisa, Italy, and uh, prototype detectors in uh, Tokyo, Japan. Uh, we require a network like this for confidence that anything we see is real because there's noise in these detectors that we don't understand. And uh, so we need to see the same excitations in uh, several detectors uh, uh, in coincidence. And also to extract the two gravitational waveforms and determine the direction of the source by triangulation. This is the, uh, one of the two LIGO detectors in the U.S., and that is the other. LIGO is a collaboration of about 500 scientists around the world. The French-Italian Virgo collaboration has, uh, I estimate, about 150 scientists. Maybe somebody can correct me. I think that's about, about the number. And this and is a, also Dutch and Polish scientists. And there's also Dutch and Polish scientists involved now. There's a strong, a strong group in, uh, in, in uh, Poland and in uh, Holland in the Netherlands. Uh, this is a photograph of, uh, of the Virgo detector in Pisa, Italy. An important point is that all gravitational wave delta ana data analysis is done jointly by the Virgo and LIGO scientists. These projects have been merged so far as getting sciences out. And this is crucial because you really need all the detectors working together in order to be sure that what you see is real in order to get maximum information out from a source. When we proposed the LIGO uh, gravity wave uh, project, uh, Ray Weiss, Ron Drever, and I, back in 1989, we said this was what, what, what would be the noise 
in our first interferometers. And that's what the noise was during our long, uh, two-year long gravity wave search uh, between uh, 2005 and 2009 in the two detectors, two large detectors, the green noise in Livingston, Louisiana, and the red noise in Hanford, Washington. It's remarkable how well the uh, team did in reproducing what we said we would do. Uh, there was a two-year search, so-called S5 search for gravitational waves, in November 2005 to October 2007. There were interesting limits on waves from various sources, no detections yet. Uh, black hole, black hole binaries with total masses below 35 uh, solar masses, less than about one in a thousand years in a Milky Way equivalent galaxy in a set of, in, in a, a set of, in a galaxy of this sort of the Milky Way. Uh, here are references to where you find details. Uh, there was a, a gamma ray burst that was spatially coincident with Andromeda Galaxy, but uh, it is clearly not a, a normal GRB from Andromeda because we didn't see gravitational waves from it. It's probably a soft gamma repeater. But, uh, there uh, is a targeted pulsar search, which has shown that, uh, for example, the crab pulsar, which is losing energy, uh, it's gradually spinning down, that less than 7% of the spin down energy is going into gravitational waves. And the sto stochastic background in our frequency band is less than 7 times 10 to the minus 6 of the closure density. Uh, and so these are beginning to be interesting uh, uh, limits, and there are a large number of other uh, results from the LIGO Virgo collaboration. Uh, looking to the future, the initial interferometers for black hole binaries can see to 100 megaparsecs, uh, and out to that distance, the estimated event rate is less than of order, or of order one in 10 years. So you might ask, why did we ever build a detector when we didn't expect to see waves? And we were very much criticized for doing that. We had a lot of trouble getting this approved, uh, getting it through Congress. It had, had to be approved in Congress. Uh, but we said in our proposal, that we had to do this in two steps, that they, well, ultimately we wanted to build more advanced detectors, but uh, we could not pull it off successfully without doing it in steps. And so we would build first detectors at a level where we have a possibility to see gravitational waves, but not a high probability, and then we would upgrade. So the first mini upgrade is just to modest improvements in this that is current, currently underway, and, detect, and the first uh, searches with this enhanced interferometer, uh, uh, with these enhanced interferometers, enhanced uh, LIGO and Virgo, have just gotten started, looking about twice as far away uh, as the initial interferometers, so event rate less than an order one per year estimated from population synthesis estimates. Uh, advanced detectors, which are the things we wanted to build in the first place, uh, will see black hole mergers out to a redshift of 0.2, and the estimated event rate from population synthesis is one per day to one per year. And so even under the most conservative estimates, uh, we have a lot of confidence of seeing things. For neutron star, neutron star binaries, where we don't have to rely, rely on population synthesis because we have observed systems of this sort in our own galaxy that we can extrapolate from. Estimated event rate is two per day uh, to one per month in the advanced uh, detectors. And so this is a very exciting uh, looking to the future. Advanced interferometers have a very extreme experimental challenge. The challenge is to monitor the motions of 40 kilogram mirrors to an accuracy of 10 to the minus 17 centimeters, 10 to the minus 13th of the wavelength of light, or the half width of the Schrodinger wave function of the center of mass degree of freedom of a mirror. So for the first time in these advanced detectors, humans will see human-sized objects, 40 kilogram mirrors, behave quantum mechanically. And in order to deal with this, we have built into the design of these detectors and the data analysis so-called quantum non-demolition technology, which Jean-Pierre mentioned briefly in his introduction. I want to say just a little bit about this. Uh, so uh, what time? time should I quit? I should be quitting shortly, I presume. Continue a little bit. Okay. okay, 10 or 15 minutes, okay. So an interferometer can be thought of as similar to a Heisenberg microscope. You're measuring the position of a mirror with light, with lots of photons instead of just with one photon. In a Heisenberg microscope, as we all know from elementary quantum mechanics, the uh, 
light pressure from the photon that you use to measure a pos particle's position kicks the photon, thereby enforcing the uncertainty principle. Similarly here, fluctuations in radiation pressure on the mirrors kick the mirrors, uh, thereby enforcing the uncertainty principle. There is a so-called standard quantum limit that uh, you cannot go below with a conventional interferometer design Radi at high uh, radiation, at high, high intensity for the laser beam, uh, your shot noise is very low uh, due to discreteness of photons in, uh, in the output. The radiation pressure fluctuations are very high and the noise curve looks like this, whereas at lower uh, light intensity you have higher shot noise, lower radiation pressure, and this line, this so-called standard quantum limit is the best you can do. It's very important to understand this uncertainty principle. And I want to do, do one somewhat technical uh, slide because what I'm going to tell you should be in every elementary quantum mechanics textbook and it is not in any elementary quantum mechanics textbooks. There are two independent uncertainty principles. I learned this from my Russian colleagues, Burginsky and colleagues, and then I helped them write a paper to explain it. Okay. There's the quantum state uncertainty principle, which you're all familiar with, the commutator of position and momentum for a particle, which is, say, the center of mass degree of freedom of this mirror, is I h bar. And so independent of the quantum state of that particle, the uncertainty in the position and the uncertainty of momentum have a product that's greater than or equal to h bar over 2. Not so well known is a precise version of the back action uncertainty principle that is the principle of the Heisenberg microscope. The light superposes super shot noise on the output signal from an interferometer so that the output signal is the actual position information about the posi position of this mirror plus the shot noise converted into a position measurement noise. The light also kicks the mirrors by radiation pressure fluctuation to produce a momentum change that is very uncertain, the momentum radiation pressure change of momentum, so that after a measurement has been made, the momentum of the mirror is the initial momentum plus the uh, kick that has been given. The shot noise and the, ra and the kick are also observable in quantum theory, and they, their commutator is minus I h bar. This is what's not in textbooks. This is a very general result that's true for any linear measurement. Any measurement where the interaction Hamiltonian is bilinear in a, uh, in a uh, observable of the measured uh, uh, object, observable of the measuring device. It's a very general result. Uh, and as a result, the com as a result, there's an uncertainty principle between the uh, position measurement noise and the kick uh, that is the same because that sign in the commutator doesn't do it, ha has no importance for the uncertainties. On the other hand, the output signal is the sum of x and, x and, no and the noise, the kick afterward, the momentum afterwards is the sum of momentum and the kick, and uh, those two commute because of that minus sign in the noise. And so, in fact, the output signal, as it turns out, uh, as you make measurement after measurement after measurement, each successive measurement is influenced by the momentum of the uh, test mass in a previous measurement. It turns out, when you go through the details, that the output signal at a time t commutes with the output signal at a later time because of this commutation, which means the output signal is a classical signal. And if you make a highly accurate measurement, that means successive measurements do not need to impede the accuracy of the preceding measurement. It's really re remarkable. And this guarantees that if you're clever, the collapse of the wave function in one measurement does not need to uh, cause uh, damage to the accuracy of a future measurement. So LIGO is designed, LIGO and Virgo, advanced LIGO and Virgo are designed uh, in order that this happens, that uh, wave function collapse on the test masses does not interfere with the accuracy of the next measurement, and thereby you can beat the standard quantum limit. Uh, there are various ways to circumvent the standard quantum limit. I'm not going to go into them uh, for lack of time, 
uh, but there's a lot of literature now on it, and it is all really relies on the fact that, it, that collapse of the wave function does not have to get in the, measure, in the way of making uh, measurements when you're trying to measure the gravity wave signal. Um, we also have plans to uh, operate uh, LIGO in a mode both for searching for gravity waves in which the output is independent of the mirror quantum state, so we can beat the standard quantum limit, but also to do macroscopic quantum mechanics experiments in which you have a different experimental protocol, a different data analysis uh, uh, technique in which uh, you do state preparation, evolution, and measurement just like in any other quantum measurement. And uh, we thereby will make the output maximally sensitive to the mirror quantum state. And so we can explore quantum behavior of 40 kilogram particles when working with LIGO in one mode. We can search for gravity waves in a manner that's unaffected by quantum behavior of the mirrors working in the other mode. One example is that uh, we expect to generate and observe quantum entanglement of 40 kilogram particles that are separated by four kilometers uh, distance. And so it would be really interesting to see a quantum entanglement of a uh, human-sized object. Well, just a few words about LISA. You're probably all familiar with LISA, later in a former space antenna, going after gravitational waves, among other things, from supermassive black holes out to redshifts uh, of order the, whatever is the earliest uh, uh, time in the universe that uh, supermassive black holes form. Uh, LISA has three spacecraft track each other with laser beams uh, and move in the same orbit as the Earth around the Sun. There's very rich astrophysics and physics to be done with LISA, and Sterl Finney, my colleague in my Caltech research group, was here in Paris, I understand, last year and talked about the astrophysics. I'm just going to finish uh, this uh, seminar with a few examples uh, from the warped side of the universe. One is mapping a quiescent black hole. If we have a small black hole orbiting around a large black hole, it turns out, and gradually spiraling in, it turns out that the gravitational waves that are emitted carry encoded in them a full map of the space-time metric of the big black hole that's being explored by the small black hole as it spirals in. Just to look at some numbers, uh, the, if the big black hole is about a million solar masses and the small one is about 10 solar masses, then the system is about 5 million kilometers in size, uh, about the same size as the LISA gravity wave detect detection system, separated by 3 billion light years. In the final year of inspiral of the small black hole, uh, it will uh, go make a, about 100,000 orbits in a region that is just the region that I depict here, in a region whose circumference is less than four times the circumference of uh, the big black hole. 200,000 cycles of waves plus lots of higher harmonics that carry enormously accurate information about the space-time geometry in just the region that I'm showing here. Uh, so that, for example, you can uh, see to accuracy of a fraction of a percent, whether uh, the space-time geometry is, uh, obeys the no-hair theorem, that whether it really is a Kerr space-time geometry or not. Uh, and what if the maps that we get out are not those of a Kerr black hole? Well, then we may have discovered a new type of inhabitant of the dark side of the universe. Uh, two long-shot possibilities are dense mad objects made from cold, dark matter or naked singularities. And so my attitude about naked singularities is, yes, they're probably forbidden as ge in generic situations in nature, but we have the tools to search for them, so we will search. And we'll see whether we see uh, compact objects with small objects spiraling into them uh, in the universe that uh, have a different uh, space-time geometry from that of the Kerr metric. Finally, over the next 40 years, uh, the great real excitement will be probing the initial one second of the universe's life. As you you're all know from uh, being astrophysicists, photons bring us a picture of what the universe looks like in the cosmic microwave background, what it looked like at age, well, about 380,000 years, to astrophysical accuracy, age 100,000 years. Because er earlier than that, the universe was so hot and so dense that the optical depth was much bigger than one for photons. Earlier than one second, the optical depth to neutrinos was, uh, uh, was bigger than one, and the neutrinos couldn't propagate. So if we can ever see the cosmic uh, the neutrinos from the Big Bang, 
they'll bring us a picture of the universe at age one second. Gravitational waves never were scattered or absorbed significantly by matter, going back to the Planck era. So they are our only tool for directly observing the Planck era, for directly observing the first one second of the life of the universe. And in that first one second, there was a lot of rich violence, we think. First there was inflation, uh, and the signal, the gravitational wave signal from inflation will indirectly be observed, I'm quite sure, through its impact on the polarization of the cosmic microwave background within the next decade or so. Planck is up there looking for a signal of this sort, probably doesn't have enough sensitivity to see it, but uh, follow-on missions will. Uh, cosmic strings uh, produced in the early universe uh, are uh, predicted to be produced uh, through, the in, through the expansion during inflation uh, of fundamental strings. It's not a firm prediction, but there's pretty good evidence that this, that this uh, should happen according to string theorists like Joel Kulczynski. Uh, when two cosmic strings pass through each other, they have a high probability to reconnect according to theory, and when they have reconnected, then you get a cusp or a kink on the string that uh, generates a burst of gravitational waves with a very characteristic waveform. And LIGO Virgo team has ser been searching for these bursts of gravitational waves with just that waveform, and the first paper has already uh, been published on that search. Um, the fundamental forces were born as the universe expanded. The classic example is that at age 10 to the minus 12 seconds, when the uh, temperature of the primordial plasma was about 1 TeV, there was presumably a phase transition in which the electroweak force came apart to produce the electromagnetic force and the weak force. If this occurred in a strongly first order phase transition, and we don't know whether it was strongly first order or not, then it will occur in bubbles. You'll have a bubble where the forces are separate and then the bulk out here where they're uh, unified. And those bubbles then expand rapidly, collide, and produce a burst of gravitational waves which then get redshifted as the universe expands and are put right into Lisa's frequency domain. So Lisa will go after the waves uh, that tell us about the birth of the electromagnetic and weak force. LIGO and Virgo probe the physics of the universe at age 10 to the minus 22 seconds at temperatures of 10 to the 5 TeV. We don't have any idea, but uh, LIGO and Virgo will go after trying to see if there's any uh, signal from there. And finally, our four-dimensional universe may in fact be a brain, a surface in a higher dimensional bulk, uh, and if so, it could well have formed wrinkled, and as the universe expanded, adjacent regions discover the wrinkle between themselves, and there is tension in our brain, and uh, the brain then quickly unwrinkles itself and vibrates in the bulk. Those vibrations show up inside our brain as uh, gravitational waves. Uh, then that are produced by this process in the very early universe, and there are papers by Craig Hogan, for example, on this process. This is an example of the kind of surprise that gravitational waves may bring us about the warped side of the universe.